everybody. Happy Friday and welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Sinead DeFries, and this is the daily show where we bring you the latest news from the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Joining us this morning is Dennis Zen. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another brand new episode of Collider Movie Talk. Everyone seems to be getting sick here. I am the only one who's, I think, one of the few people that are still surviving. I'm battling it, but I I'm okay for now. I'm going to come lick your face after this. <laughs> <laughs> Just watch out. Also here is John Roca. That was amazing. Uh, hey, I'm wearing my uh, Ravenclaw scarf in honor of Fantastic Beasts coming out today. So looking forward to it. Thanks for having me on here for this Friday movie talk. And I'm not sick. Also here is Barry Nemiroff. I'm perfectly healthy as well, but I feel like I did just put a big fat target on my back. <laughs> yeah, I'm coming. I'm coming for all of you. Oh my All right, gosh. you guys, the Crow reboot has hit a number of snags over the years, and now it looks like another obstacle has popped up for the long in development reboot. The Hollywood Reporter is claiming that the Crow reboot, now entitled The Crow Reborn, has moved on from its former home at Relativity Media after CEO Ryan Kavanaugh put the company up for sale last month. That would normally be good news since the production banner has struggled to get the reboot off of the ground, but this kind of transition also comes with a number of difficulties like contract negotiations, schedules, and creative conflicts that could very well complicate Jason Momoa and director Corin Hardy's involvement with the picture. Dennis, your, your thoughts on the new drama happening with the Crow remake? My thoughts are the next documentary that John Schnepp does should be the Crow reboot. <laughs> what happened because there's <laughs> the, the drama on this project is is endless i mean bloody disgusting is reporting that actually uh, uh hardy is actually probably still attached to the movie but it's jason momoa that's probably leaving i mean yeah. li look at that list of how many actors have been attached to this thing you had tom hiddleston luke evans nicholas holt jack houston jack o'connell and now jason momoa possibly leaving this thing the thing is, I like the original movie. Yeah. Uh, Alex Proyas directed, Brandon Lee starred in. I, unfortunately, he passed away on that set. It's a movie that I, I, I enjoy. I don't know if I need a sequel. They made like three or four direct-to-DVD, limited theatrical run movies that were not well-received financially or by the fans, but yet they're still stubbornly are moving forward with this project. I just don't, I don't see why... There's such a, like, I don't know, such a desire to get this off the ground. Roka? Yeah, well, it's interesting because it's about the fact that they want a superhero franchise, even if, a, even if it's a smaller superhero franchise, you know? And so this seems to be something they want to go and redo the original movie, right? Because those other sequels, as you said, Dennis, are diminishing returns. You know, they were really bad. Uh, but the first one has this magic to it that I think still holds up. I watched it again actually a few weeks ago on one of the, I think on Encore or something, and I really still enjoyed it. And the soundtrack is a good snapshot of the music of that time, the alternative music, the rock alternative music that was happening at that time. And so to me, it's a good, good movie. But to redo it, you need to find the right people if you're really going to relaunch this thing. And Corin Hardy, I don't know if he's the best choice for director because The Hollow wasn't that good, didn't get a lot of good reviews. And Momoa is an interesting choice because Momoa is a beast of a man. I think what you enjoyed about the original film was that Brandon Lee was like this skinnier dude who could get beat up by four people and could have to fight back and you could go along with his journey because he's an underdog. And I think when you cast someone like Momoa, that underdog aspect kind of disappears unless you make these other dudes massively huge or whatever or make it a whole gang you could do the Punisher route I guess like they did with Travolta and that but to me I think that's what, what concerns me about redoing it but I understand the desire to redo it but the fact that it keeps getting snake bit every single time doesn't bode well for the future of this thing. Perry? I just feel bad at this point. <laughs> I love The Crow and I was kind of excited for this idea when it first came up mm. but I have the same feeling about this project that I do about uh, Terry Gilliam's Don Quixote oh, movie yeah. where we've just been talking about it for so long. He's been working on that for so long. I just want the best for him and for him to finally have it realized and bring it to screen. And I kind of feel that way about this project now. We've been hearing about it for so many years and there's just been, it's like a roller coaster ride where just like ups and downs nonstop. Mm. I kind of just want to see what happens out of like sheer curiosity if they pull it off. I don't like this title that's been circulating though. The Crow Reborn. Yeah. Yeah. That just sounds cheesy and not <laughs> like the movie I'd want, but it's also just worth discussing where the project went because I, I looked up all these companies. I'm not particularly familiar with them or with that one producer that the article named, except uh, 
he seems to be behind most of the Resident Evil movies, if oh. not all of them. Right. But I was looking up all those companies, and, and there's nothing really, unless I was looking up the wrong company, and to be honest, it is kind of difficult to find these things and find the right entity because there's so many different production companies that are based in other countries, too. So it's hard to pinpoint exactly which ones they are, but based on what I looked up, none of those companies had anything on their existing resume that suggested that's an entity that could actually make this happen and yeah. finally get it off the ground. So I don't know if this is going to happen at all. Yeah, and the question is, is there an audience yeah. for it? Is it? Are people, I mean, I know you mentioned that they want their comic book franchise, but this is not a typical superhero right. story that, that most people are fam, you know, familiar with. It's not, but it seems like it would have the same kind of look and tone maybe mm -hmm. of a, not that this is what anybody wants, but it could be something similar to the Resident Evil franchise right. where, I mean, I've never read the source material. I only know The Crow from the original mm. movie. But maybe there's some opportunities to kind of add to the lore and create, I don't know, create creatures or whatever they do with those with well, Resident Evil movies at yeah, this point. Yeah, also the, it's in the vein of like the Blade movies, that kind of thing where it's one guy against everyone. He's kind of otherworldly in the way that he does it. And so it does like, but everything is a revenge story. So mm -hmm. what do you do? Do you just reboot it and make it another revenge story? Or do you expand the universe? I mean, that's kind of, if you're going to make it a franchise, you've got to do that. You've definitely got to get it. So it sets up a universe if you think you're going to do it whole thing of movies following afterwards yeah. you can make money off of it didn't nbc uh, retitle their their reboot of uh, heroes heroes reborn, reborn. as well yeah, yeah. well not, yeah, a good, not, not, not a good track record <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> all right guys now we're moving on to <laughs> buy or sell uh Sinead, what we got first Sony Pictures has released a new clip of passengers. While on a routine journey through space to a new home, two passengers sleeping in suspended animation are awakened 90 years too early when their ship malfunctions. It stars Jennifer Lawrence as Aurora Dunn and Chris Pratt as Jim Preston, with the clip giving audiences a better idea of the different threats our space travelers will face on their interstellar mission. The movie will hit theaters this year on December 21st. Perry, do you buy or sell the new clip from Passengers? Oh, man. That image just makes me <laughs> giggle. I feel like because of that alone, I need to I need to sell the clip. I'm still intrigued enough. <laughs> giggling. Can't help it. Um, I'm still intrigued enough by the premise of the movie. When this movie was first announced, and especially when they screened that first footage at CinemaCon, and it was received very well, I got really hyped. I'm a fan of Jennifer Lawrence. I'm a fan, fan of uh, Chris Pratt. I liked them being in this idea together. However... Ever since I've been seeing teasers and trailers and now this clip, the more I see, the less interested I become because the more I see, the more I see headliners, Jennifer Lawrence, Chris Pratt, flashy sci-fi stuff. I, it, it seems to be losing the humanity and the heart and kind of almost like the quiet nature that I was hoping for and expecting from this movie. Not that my hopes and expectations <clears throat> should dictate what it could be. I mean, for all I know, it'll come out and completely surprise me, but I had a very hard time taking this clip seriously. Roga? Yeah, I absolutely sell this clip. I think it's ridiculous. I think the fact that you, we're 2016 and we're still doing these old tropes of having a woman in a in essentially her bra and panties, yes, quote, bathing suit, but it looks like bra and panties in a wet T-shirt in the water, and you're selling your, your main actress. You're not seeing Chris Pratt doing this. You're seeing Jennifer Lawrence. And I, so to me, I sell it because I think it's a, a ridiculous clip to use. And although it does give you an idea of the dangers that the ship is going to pose in the film, I think for me, it still bothers me that they're doing this old stuff. And it doesn't. It, they should have released another clip that got you into the idea of what the ship, how the ship can endanger both of them. What is the ship doing that's going to mess with both of them? Because right now, my feeling about this is this feels more like Solaris and not like Alien and not like Event Horizon. This feels like, and so if this is going to be like what you call essentially a seafaring film in space where you're just stuck on a ship the whole time, that's dangerous. But I do give the idea that it's directed by Morton, Morton Tilden, who did mm -hmm. Meditation Game, yeah. which I enjoyed. I mm -hmm. really enjoyed the nuance of that film. It's a very powerful film. So if, he, if, they, if they can start focusing the advertising, the marketing more to that vein, instead of trying to make it seem like this event picture, I think it'll be more successful. Because he's cast these good actors. Michael Sheen's in it. These are, these are good actors in this film that, they, that they're using that can do really well nuanced uh, interactions on film. And so for me, this seemed like a, a useless clip to, to, so I sell it. I am actually going to go against the panel <laughs> and I buy this clip. Maybe I just wasn't looking at that aspect of it, but to me, I just enjoyed it because it's one, it's a, it's a clip that shows off something from the movie that shows you a peek into the world that, that lends you without revealing any major plot points to it. And it, it puts you 
in a place of the character where, where you're talking about the dangers with the, the gravity. And, and visually, I thought it looked really cool oh, with, yeah. with how the water was. And I do trust Morton Tilden. Imitation Game, I actually really enjoyed that film. And I had been critical of the trailers of, of that movie because I remember seeing the trailers and I'm like, they just showed us the whole movie. But when I actually saw it, I was like, okay, there's a lot more to this. And that's how I feel Passengers is going to be like. It's going to... I think it's going to surprise people. Yeah. Um, Sinead, uh, what, do you, what did you think of this clip? Did you check it out? Uh huh. Um, it's okay. I didn't hate it. I do think it's a little cheese ball, but I'm still intrigued enough about the movie. We've been talking about it for so long, so it's still something I definitely will see. But it is falling on the um, cheesy side for me right now based on this clip alone. Before this clip, I would have said, like, all right, I'm still, in I'm still interested. And even though I am still interested, it is a little bit like, what are you guys doing? Mm. All right, Wendy? I think my interest has dwindled a little bit after mm -hmm. seeing this clip, unfortunately. Am I still going to go see the movie? Sure. Just not as high of expectation. Yeah. All right. All right, guys, uh, let us know what you think on the chat board in the comment section below. Uh, Sinead, what do we got next? Disney has released a new featurette for Rogue One, giving Star Wars fans a closer behind-the-scenes look at director Gareth Edwards' first Star Wars story spinoff. The two-minute look contains a bit of new footage, which focuses on the connection this movie has to the original Star Wars Episode IV, A New Hope. Rogue One is gearing up for its last marketing push ahead of its December 16th debut in theaters. Roka, do you buy or sell the new featurette for Rogue One? Oh, man, I, I couldn't buy this more. This looks so great. Every single piece of promotion they've done for this film has just made me even more excited, like I I discovering newer and newer levels of being excited about a Star Wars uh, property, about a Star Wars piece of media like this. And especially a film that's going to go against the grain of what we've seen before. I was worried about the reshoots. I was worried about all the other things. But everything that's come bef uh, to promote it has been so good to get you back on it, get you back on board. And even this featurette does the same thing. The same starkness, the same darkness, the same gritty nature of it is there. The war aspect, <clears throat> excuse me, you see them going undercover as Empire. As, I'm sorry, part, part of the Imperials. You see that going on. And you see like the, the mirroring shots from New Hope yeah. that will mix. So that's a great, it's a way of tying it in without making it overt, right? And I love that they, <clears throat> what Gareth Edwards said about the crawl. The crawl is where you see their basis for their movie. And to me, I remember always thinking, God, I'd love to see what happened with those rebels and the spies. I remember that every single time. The first time I watched it, because it just intrigues you. They just went, rebels, blah, 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 and then spies. And then you're like, okay, what happened? What, how come we don't know about that? And now that we're getting that movie, I'm so excited. <laughs> the fact that you see the X-Wing and I'm sorry, I'm, I'm so You've excited. You've been in this talk. studio for 15 minutes. Yeah, you sorry, 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 You've been sorry, around what, Sinead for like a What oh. you guys didn't see was Sinead licked his face <laughs> no, in the middle of the shot. Really did. <laughs> but no, I mean, the, the X-Wing and the hangar, Yavin 4, you see those TIE fighters tearing ass across the sky. Like All of it is just so, so amazing and so incredible. And for me, I'm a big fan of what they're going to do with this movie. And this just gets you more into it and lets you know that Gareth Edwards is really the perfect guy they could have chosen to direct this film. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to buy this as well. They had released a featurette earlier. I think it was during Star Celebration, Wars Celebration. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a similar tone. This one, though, plays more on the nostalgia with those parallel, parallel shots between A New Hope and Rogue One. Yeah. You also get to see a Diego Luna. He's in a, like an Empire uh, officer's right. uniform. So you see little glimpses that we haven't seen before. Perry, what do you think? I buy this. I'll take anything Rogue One I can get at this point. I am counting down the minutes until I see this movie. I want my screening invite so I can stop trying to guess <laughs> when I'm finally going to see it. I, I love this kind of stuff. And I've said this before a number of times. One of my favorite things about marketing is when they make, when they make the viewer and the fans feel like they're part of the production. And with something like Star Wars, there's no better way to do it than by making a featurette where the filmmakers and the cast and everybody talks about how much they love the franchise and, yeah. oh, my God, we're making a Star Wars movie now. Look at where we are. And that's the, that's the feeling I got from this. That was the feeling I got from the uh, featurette at Celebration, which I think was really one of the best featurettes I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. I know that everybody at Celebration was disappointed not to get more from any of the feature films, what? but... I was pretty satisfied with that featurette and, and the short teaser we did get there. But I just, I love everything I'm seeing about this movie. This is this is the war, the Star Wars war movie that I want. That shot with the TIE fighters, yeah. that was that was one of the moments in this where, where I kind of like, <laughs> I, like I didn't make any sounds, but I'm like, I'm like, oh my God, yeah. you know? And I just, I love um, the new the new stormtroopers. I love the shore troopers. Mm -hmm. I just got, you'll, you'll be jealous. I just got little vinyl mation uh, shore troopers and oh, I got nice. like a whole little brigade now. They're just so cool. <laughs> I love everything. And then the shot of the droid, the yeah. behind the scenes shot of the 
the droid. If you give me anything with stormtroopers or droids, I'm going to freak out. Yeah, the R2-D2 that is chrome silver that is doing, like, the, the unit, the R2-D2 unit that's chrome silver and doing what the R2 unit, rather. All of that is so, so cool. And what you get from this, again, this is just brilliant timing with the marketing, right? You had the feature app before. Then you had these little TV spots. Now you have Catalyst coming out, and then the feature. So all of it, and the trailer. So all of it combined, you just are just getting the right amount of information to get you super excited. Well, speaking movie. speaking of Catalyst, Catalyst uh, Chris, is changing everything for me. Chris, yeah. everything. Christian did an interview with the Catalyst director, James Lucino. If yeah. you guys don't know what Catalyst is, it's it's a Star Wars novel, which is part of canon. It takes place before Rogue One, and it deals with. Uh, Jin Erso's father and, and how I, I actually just started on Audible so I, I've listened to the first I think two or three chapters how far are you I'm I think I'm like five or six hours in okay. at this point mm. it's it's a really damn good book I mean I brought cool. this up on council yesterday but you know how when you read a book it takes you a little while to get wrapped up yeah. in it and to care about the characters not this right from the beginning it's a really captivating opening kind of sequence I guess but Right off the bat, you are so into the Urso family and what they're mm. going through. And this is really a book that could, not that I'm saying the movie's gonna be reliant on people having read the book and having this understanding of the character's background, yeah. but this is a book that really could enhance the experience when you finally see the movie. Yeah, I felt that way about Bloodline. Uh, yeah. Reading that Absolutely. after Force Awakens, I was like, wow, I wish I had read this before the movie came mm. out. Then you would have more insight into Leia and what was happening with, with her. Yeah. All right, what's next? It's been 11 years since Owen Wilson and Vince Vaughn appeared in the comedy hit Wedding Crashers, and now, according to Isla Fisher, it looks as though we might get a sequel. While appearing on the Today Show to promote Nocturnal Animals, Fisher announced that Vince Vaughn told her a sequel was in development. I bumped into Vince Vaughn at a party, and he said that apparently we're going to be making a sequel. So I'm really excited to see what's happened to Gloria. Dennis, do you buy or sell a sequel to Wedding Crashers? Uh, I'm going to have to sell it. Uh, Wedding Crashers, it was a movie that I enjoyed. I, I don't think I liked or loved it as much as other people. I, I heard so much hype about it before it came out about, oh, this is the new old school. This new I love old school. Mm -hmm. So when I saw it, I was like, okay, I enjoyed it. I don't really... I, I, don't, I think I maybe have seen it one time since the theater. Uh, so to me, and then also these comments, it's like, yeah, she heard from Vince Vaughn that they're talking about it. Everyone talks about plenty of sequels. We, they've been talking about a Goonies sequel for... God knows how long, which I know. Rope I don't know why. Ro Rope I don't know huge why. Fan, huge I, fan. I don't know why. What's wrong with you? Oh my there, there's gosh. a lot of things wrong with him. That's Please. just one part. Someone one told part me of. this like casually in the office. Scott the other day, and, and I, I almost had a meltdown. Scott Mance and I have come together on this. We both think Goonies are an overrated film. So All let's right. go. Let's go <gasps> yeah, I don't understand. I do not understand. The wow. The next time yeah. I see him. <laughs> What are you talking about, Perry? You guys are <laughs> Perry, do you want me to lick his face? Yes. 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 Do it yes. now. I will. Um, the only reason I kind of would want to see it is I'd, I'd like to see Vince Vaughn get back into it. Like, I think he's a talented comedic actor. Mm -hmm. Not even just a comedic actor. I think he's a talented dramatic actor. If you've seen uh, that movie he did with Joaquin Phoenix a, a while back, that was like when he first, like mm -hmm. right after I think Swingers came out. Yeah. Uh, it was a dramatic role, and he actually has a lot of dramatic chops. I thought True Detective season two was going to be it. <laughs> that was a train wreck. <laughs> so that didn't happen. So that would be my only reason why I'd want to see one. Perry? He's also great in Hacksaw Ridge. Yes. Okay, I haven't seen Really, that really good in that movie. Um, I'll sell it. Like, I, I don't want a Wedding Crashers mm -hmm. movie. However, I watched the clip where she's talking about it on the Today Show, and, you know, this isn't me knowing anything for real. This is me just trying to read her body language and the way she presents the information. And it wasn't something along the lines of, oh, I you know, he casually brought it up to me. It seemed like they had a conversation because when she presented the information it was Vince Vaughn told me that we're we're going to make one or you know just something along more definitive lines where it made me think oh this wasn't just like a party conversation this sounded like a little mm -hmm. more firm of a plan that could actually happen however then when it, when I kind of take a step back and think Okay, but then we just had Zoolander. Yeah. It was awful. It didn't do well. Bad Santa's not getting the best reception, I think, thus not far. Yeah. I, I don't Comedy know Comedy sequels if aren't doing very well. They're, mm. they're not good, and they're not doing well, which is why I think they might have a hard time getting a green light for something like this, but also as a huge Wedding Crashers fan, I've seen that movie countless times. However, I've only ever had the urge to re-watch Wedding Crashers. Not once has it ever crossed my mind, oh, you know what would be interesting? seeing the next chapter of their story mm. 
Wedding Crashers is a standalone movie and it should stay that way. Mm. Broke it. Uh, this is tough. This is tough because I, I absolutely love the movie too, Perry. I own it. I, I watch it a, a lot. I just right. love the movie. I think it's really funny. And the movie hinges on those 20 minutes. Those last 20 minutes mm. when Owen gets found out and to near the to end when he finally has goes to the wedding and confronts Rachel McAdams. If you're in for those 20 minutes and when he goes to Will Ferrell and everything, then you enjoy the movie. If you're not, then you're not a big fan of the movie. And to me, I enjoy this going scene over and over again. I love it when it's on TNT, whatever, I watch it. The question is, do I buy or sell a sequel? So I will tentatively <laughs> buy it because I would love to see these characters get back together again. I don't think Isla Fisher has been fantastic in anything since Wedding Crashers. She's a good, solid actress, absolutely, but I don't think she's like been amazing like she was in Wedding Crashers. I mean, that blew her up like crazy. So she's the perfect person to kind of drop this seed a little bit, playfully say like, oh, what, I just heard it in a party, whatever. Like People plan this stuff out sometimes, and I think maybe she dropped it. It's just to see what the interest would be and going forward. You know, like, like when that Deadpool stuff leaked, people do stuff on purpose, you know, and I feel like she is maybe leaking this a little bit on a national audience. This isn't like Tara Reid saying mm -hmm. there's a big Lebowski sequel coming in. <laughs> Going, mm. uh, she's crazy. Don't listen to her. You know, this is Isla Fisher, who is very well respected. She's married to Sasha Baron Cohen. She's not going to do stupid things like this and without some kind of backup. And so I think th I think this is the possibility of it. So I would buy it just to see these people get together and see what happens. I didn't mind Zool Zoolander too so much. I know okay. people hated. That. I didn't mind it. And so it's like it's. I didn't think the first one was that good either. So I, it was okay. Zoolander too. Oh, you're so, with Christian on that one. Yeah. Huh? Oh my. God, I don't get the Zoolander love at all. But I enjoyed this. I just thought the second one was all right. Uh, for what it was. See but that I can understand versus Goonies because Zoolander, Zoolander movies like Step Brothers, that's the kind of thing where Goonies where is at seventy percent on Rotten Tomatoes. That tells you that a lot of people didn't like this movie. It tells you that there's like thirty heartless people <laughs> who don't enjoy a good coming of age yeah. adventure out there. But yes. Zoolander is one of those ones. Not not to get off yeah. track here that. It gets funnier the more you watch it. I have like the same Anchorman. feeling with with Anchorman, Anchorman Step absolutely. Brothers, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. I will I will give a pass on that one. Yeah, but with this, I would love to see what they could do just to see. But you're right, Perry. I kind of am in your camp in the fact that this was a perfect standalone movie. They get they all get together at the end. Everything's fine and everything's done. So where do we go from here? Like, do they break up? Do they divorce? Mm -hmm. Does she go? Do they have kids? If they have kids, what happens with that? Are they crashing as a family now? What is that like? There's there's possibilities, but I, it's. It, like you said, Dennis, comedy sequels is a tough line to walk. Now I'm picturing like a Meet the Parents uh, That's certainly possible. track for this, which, you know, and it, it is great. didn't pan out all that well for right, that franchise. True, yeah. But James got Seymour. Ones out of it. Yeah, there's people. Yeah. Uh, Wendy and Sinead, what do you guys think about Wedding Crashers 2? Are you guys looking, would you guys be looking forward to one? Um, I would for sure buy the hell out of a Wedding Crashers sequel. I love this movie. Yeah. And Isla Fisher is fantastic in this movie. No one made me laugh harder than Gloria did in mm -hmm. Wedding Crashers. And yeah, sure, it's a standalone movie, but I also feel like making a sequel out of something that's not like a beloved classic is the way to go because um, it's there's less expectation. And I honestly think that a movie like this could, there could be another chapter because it kind of ends with them just finding happiness, mm -hmm. I would love to see where they are. And this movie's awesome, so I don't understand why you wouldn't want to see it. <laughs> <laughs> Wendy? Go lick his face. Yeah, go lick your face, Dennis. <laughs> no, I am looking forward to it, but I do, and I agree with everything Sinead just said, so I'm going to echo that, but I do think it's like kind of a little late it's been so many years yeah. how many years five years or it's something like that Eleven. so but oh my god really i feel yeah. so old yeah it's a long time goodness this is intentional though i think you guys are right i think that this was planned mm -hmm. and that this was completely like you're going on the today show to promote a movie that everyone's talking about yeah. and people will be tuning into this interview and i 100 percent think it was an intentional plug mm -hmm. all right what's next Focus Features has released the first trailer for director Nikki Caro's best-selling adaptation of The Zookeeper's Wife. Based on the novel of the same name, the film stars Jessica Chastain as a real-life wife of a zookeeper living in Poland during World War II, who, alongside her husband, operated a zoo as a secret sanctuary for Jews looking for refuge. It opens in theaters on March 31st, 2017. Roka, do you buy or sell the first trailer for The Zookeeper's Wife? Ah, oh, such a good question, isn't it? Do I buy or sell this? I wanted to buy it and then i watched the trailer and i i have to say i can't i have to sell it a little bit because i nothing about this was different than any other nazi film i've seen before any other 
film that I've seen where they're trying to hide people out. And it seemed to hit, it felt a lot like Like Water for Elephants, like that kind of vibe to it, which of course it doesn't have to do with nothing, but like it has, it just has that kind of feel to it that it seems distant. I can't gravitate to any of the characters or connect with any of the characters. I understand that it's an important piece. And these stories need to be told and keep being told for the rest of our entire lives so we never forget a very, very terrible time in our world's history, absolutely. But I feel like this is checking the boxes that may don't make me feel necessarily 100% like I'm going to see any kind of new groundbreaking film about Nazi occupation, about people hiding Jews uh, as best they can. Um, and I, I, Chastain's accent was a little like, I'm like, where is this from? I don't know, is this some just, some, just a European, blank European accent? And uh, Daniel Rule playing a Nazi again. Yeah. Like these, these are things that kind of to me like are a little bit negatives about the film. But Nikki Caro is a fantastic director, and I loved Whale Rider. It is one of those films that I defend and fight and push people to watch all the time. One of these quiet films that did such great work and such beautiful, uh, beautiful film work, film work in that in that movie. And so, any chance that she gets to direct a film, I'm 100 percent on board with. I think this the, doesn't necessarily check check all the boxes for me to rush out and go see it. So I have to sell it a little bit. Yeah, I'm torn as well. I mean, I, I, I I'm tentatively gonna buy it is it's definitely an interesting story but then at the same time kind of like how i complain about imitation games trailers i almost feel like i'm i'm seeing the whole movie yeah. here they show the the zoo burning they show people getting separated and then coming back together it just feels like they're taking you through the whole movie already yeah. and you're right about daniel Brule. like when i first watched the trailer i the first shot of him is kind of from afar i'm like ah that guy looks like daniel Brule. <laughs> And then they showed it, and it was him. And I was like, okay, he's getting typecasted real quick. You know, he was great in Glorious Bastard yes. playing a Nazi. I just didn't expect him to kind of revisit that same type of role. Yeah. I mean, I guess he's really good at it. Yeah. Uh, Perry, what do you think? I'm, I'm probably going to buy this, but I 110% I hear your complaints and issues. This does feel a bit like a paint-by-numbers trailer, which is – not the worst thing in the world, especially mm -hmm. if you want to sell the general story to a general uh, audience. Yeah. But I have high hopes that with the director, with this cast, with the way all the shots in this look mm -hmm. and the little bit of emotion that it does manage to rouse in two and a half minutes, that the full feature will still be good. And I think the zoo angle is kind of all I really needed to differentiate it from other mm. stories that cover the subject matter are presented in past movies. But... I will say, the one thing that rubbed me the wrong way was her accent. Yes. And I'm not saying I'm an expert on uh, a German accent. No. I I don't know if she's right. doing it well. I don't know if but she's, she's not doing, doing a German accent. I don't know what I don't know what she's doing. She's I don't Polish. know how, how <laughs> she's authentic. To be it. Yeah. Well, all right, whatever she is. I don't know if her her accent is uh, accurate. What I have a problem with is, and. Th th this isn't a problem, but it's just it's a problem that anybody would run into in any situation. Like when you when you see someone play a new actor, when you see them do an accent in a movie and then you see them in, and they're doing an interview in their native tongue, whatever it is, mm -hmm. you're like, oh, my God, I didn't realize you were American. I didn't realize you were mm -hmm. this or that. It's just the same thing that I'm used to mm -hmm. not hearing her speak with this accent. So it's going to startle me no matter what. So it's just a matter of when I see her performing this role in the full feature with this accent, if she manages to lose herself in the role. And at this yeah. point, I'll give her the benefit of the doubt. Seeing it in the trailer, I was a little taken aback by it. Yeah, I mean, Chastain's a fantastic actress. Yeah. Like, you can't deny that. I think she got robbed for Zero Dark Thirty. I think she was great in that. And, and that film was robbed, too. So she's... But the thing with, with this is that you know when you know. And I think as seasoned viewers, as we all are of films, we know when an accent feels right when it doesn't feel right. And when it doesn't feel right, you shouldn't denigrate your feeling that it doesn't feel right. And I, so, Perry, I would, I would support you feeling like it's not correct because I had the same vibe. And I'm an actor who does voiceover, who does accents. And so I could tell immediately what they told her. to Either she came on late to the project or <clears throat> they didn't want her to be specifically any kind of European accent. They gave her a general European accent. When you do voiceover sometimes, they tell you that. Do a general European accent which means you could do anything, any variation of it, or some kind of blanket variation of it, and so you get a little bit lost. And I think with this, when she's up against a guy who is legitimately a Polish actor with an accent, it, it will show. And that's what I'm worried about as I watch it. And I want to say one last thing. That last line when she's like, about animals, because you can see, you, that's why she loves animals, because you can see what they really feel in their eyes. That was so simplistic to me, it drove me nuts. Uh, and I was just like, that's not true. Because uh, you look at a dog, you don't know what a dog's thinking half the time. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's not true. It's not true. All right, <laughs> what's next? 
Paramount Pictures has released a new trailer for Monster Trucks Online, directed by Ice Age Helmer Chris Wedge. The film stars Lucas Till as a high school senior who builds a monster truck of his own, only to come into contact with a literal monster who decides to live inside the vehicle. It hits theaters on January 13, 2017. Perry, do you buy or sell the new trailer for Monster Trucks? I'm so conflicted about this. <laughs> <laughs> this is a silly looking trailer. It's silly. It's for kids. I'm going to buy it. Only because, and I've said this before, I did the set visit for this in 2014, and, you know, most of the time when we go on set visits, it's for a Marvel movie or a franchise movie. It was so refreshing to be on a set for an original story and to hear them try it, because, like, I didn't get to see what the final monster would look like. Mm. I only saw everything that they had practically built on set, which the car, that car that it, that it lives in, is a, a legit, like, a big car that anybody could sit in, but it's like a remote control car. And they had someone with a big controller who can, like, make it wave its uh, wheel and stuff. But just hearing them explain what the monster would look like and what it's capable of, they had some really interesting ideas that I wish were incorporated into the trailer. And there's a chance that they're not in the trailer because they're not in the final cut of the movie, which is unfortunate. The monster gets, you know, a really interesting backstory, and so does Lucas Till's character, where the monster... The monster, uh, there, there's like an oil issue and it's got to come out of its natural habitat and he, he has a family problem so, and he just wants to get out of town so he needs a new engine for his car. So it's like they meet and they're perfect for each other in a way because the monster can be the engine and control the car. I just wish they were conveying that kind of information instead of just goofy jokes and, and weird, behavior, be, weird behavior. Also, I just can't stand the name Creech. Yeah, it's so annoying. the The monster was called Big Ugly on set. I thought that was so endearing. I don't understand why they changed it, but clearly, I don't like the trailer. I'm gonna buy it though because I'm still very interested in seeing the movie and seeing how it turned out. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm selling this thing. I have no interest <laughs> in seeing this movie whatsoever. Uh, I I don't really get what what kind of demographic they're trying to hit with this thing. I think it would have been better if it was a, like a 3D animated film mm -hmm. or something like that with. But like, you know, it's like, oh, it's monster trucks. You get it? Get it? There's a monster and it's in a truck. <laughs> now, no, nothing in the trailer appealed to me. Roka? Yeah, I, I am not the demographic for this at all. Uh, I, ha I have to sell it only because I have, no, I have no desire to see this film. That being said, I think the trailer is trying to aim at like the 10-year-old, 12-year-old demographic, right? With the playfulness of the creature. The creature is interesting. It's a funny little creature. Uh, and the name Creech is interesting as well. Because it's short for creature, I guess. Like the same generation says totes and all that kind of jazz. <laughs> so they slow down, you know. They, uh, so that's fine. But the cast is interesting. Rob Lowe, Amy Ryan, Barry Pepper, Danny Glover. This is an interesting cast to put in there. Um, but the fact that they're, it's not testing well in early screenings and they're already writing it down as a loss possibly lets you know how they feel about the confidence of this movie so I sell it unfortunately because I like this actor I think this guy is great I enjoy watching him he's got a great energy to him on screen and an energy that doesn't doesn't seem like he's a pretty boy kid like he seems like he really enjoys doing what he's doing and you go along with his enthusiasm as an actor and so I was hoping to have something a little bit better from him uh, from Lucas Till so. he did seem really happy on set yeah. and I'm not just saying you know he was putting on a show for press or anything yeah. you, you can kind of tell when someone's really feeling the material and they really mm -hmm. believe in it and you know the large majority of the people that were on set they did you could tell they cared and they thought that they were making something that could have been special and I think I got the sense that what they originally were intending to do was make it a fun for the whole family kind mm -hmm. of movie. And, you know, th that's just what happens. Things change from script to production to screen in the end. And I think, you know, as it came together, it only appealed to the youngest of moviegoers, mm -hmm. which might not be the worst thing in the world, but it wasn't their original intention. Mm -hmm. All right, now we're moving on to box office predictions. This is our weekly segment that we do every Friday where we try and predict the top five movies of the weekend this is brought to you by our friends at amc theaters uh this is a game perry takes very seriously i mean seriously yeah yeah mm. uh roca what's your top five <laughs> i'm afraid to go first and what's your uh and what's your number for fantastic beasts sure. as the tiebreaker people know she takes it seriously she went on facebook last week when we didn't have a movie I talk did. on friday and, and pushed her top five and, and i was I like what, right. what are you talking about uh, anyway, you yeah, were so just intimidated. I was very it. much. You always intimidate me. So uh, <laughs> my box office, I say Fantastic Beasts, duh, and Where to Find Them is definitely first. Uh, Trolls second. 
I have Doctor Strange third holding on, still fighting. Uh, Arrival fourth, which if you haven't seen, for God's sakes, get out there and go see Arrival. It's so, so good. Uh, and Edge of Seventeen, which Perry has been a champion mm -hmm. of, and I've come around on, and I'm definitely going to go see it. It's, it's, I'm not the demographic for this movie, but I will go see it because Perry spoke so well of it. So I will put that at fifth. Uh, in my heart of hearts, I would love to move, bl move Bleed for this in the top five or Billy, Ling's, Billy Lynn's Long Halftime mm -hmm. Walk, which is probably the worst title for a film ever. I would love to move it up because I love Ang Lee, and this looks like something really different about the war that I really want to see, but I know those, those seem like smaller films that not a lot of people are going to go to. So then my number will be, I think, 82 million for okay. Fantastic Beasts. All I don't right. think it's going to blow up the box office as much as people think it is. Yeah, uh, I have Fantastic <laughs> Beasts, obviously, at number one. It, it, it pulled 8.75 million last night. Yeah. Uh, uh, I'm gonna say 85 million <laughs> okay. for it. Uh, number two, I have Doctor Strange coming in. I think that's been holding strong. Then Trolls, then Arrival, which I also agree is, is a fantastic film, one yeah. of my top ten of the year. Number five, I put Almost Christmas instead of Edge of Seventeen, oh, okay. just because Edge of Seventeen is in probably I think 300 or 400 less theaters than Almost Christmas. I think hopefully Edge of Seventeen. I haven't seen it yet, but hearing what Perry says and other people. Like, it, it's one of those actually good kind of teen mm -hmm. co comedies. Uh, so I'm going to check that out. But hopefully word of mouth, if, if the movie is good, uh, will spread and it'll, it'll get better box office yeah. the next week. Um, uh, Wendy and Sinead, do you guys have uh, oh, predictions? Really oh, sorry. Really sorry. Sorry. Me for last. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I wasn't expecting that. Perry. That's Take a great okay. She's trying to mess with, He's trying to mess with you. He's Seriously, trying to mess with you. They're, they're trying to sabotage me. <laughs> um, I'm going Fantastic Beasts at number one. Surprise, surprise. Very brave of you. Yes, I think I'm going to say 87 million, though. Ooh. There's some talk of it going north of 90, but I, wow. I don't think it's going to happen. Number two, I'm going Trolls, and it's pretty much just because that m Doctor Strange is still going to do well, but I think Trolls only dropped like 25% last weekend. There's no doubt in my mind that that thing's going to hold on just long enough to beat out Doctor Strange next week. Then at number four, I have Arrival, and five, I'm going Almost Christmas. Mm. Even And it was really hard just not to get personal about it and root for Edge of Seventeen just because I want that movie to do so well, but... You know, one's getting more theaters than the other. One has a studio behind it, whereas, you know, STX Entertainment is doing a lot of great things, and they're starting to put out movies that are getting bigger opening weekend numbers. In this case, I don't think it's going to be enough to put Edge of Seventeen over Almost Christmas, though. And you, you got burnt by Medea, so you're like, I, 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 need, <laughs> I need to focus on the African-American audience I'll a little bit I'll always believe more. in Medea from yeah. now on. That's right. <laughs> All right, now let's move on to Wendy <laughs> and Sinead. What are you guys' predictions for opening weekend for Fantastic Beasts? Well, I would have said I would have said $85 million, but just to be different than you, I will say $86 million. Oh, wow. I'm going kind of high. I'm going 92 Oof. Oh, boy. Mm. Yep. Really? Mm -hmm. All right. Um, oh, just a reminder, we have our Fantastic Beast spoiler review, which Christian, Perry, and Wendy did yesterday, and we, we posted it this morning, so check that out on the YouTube channel. Also, a reminder, we have Mailbag on Saturday and Sunday, 10 a.m., best of the week, 2 p.m. on Saturday. Also, make sure to check out our channel for breaking news, collider news, crash course. We just had one about how the Oscar nominations, w w how they work, and that was posted. And uh, we'll s and also uh, we have movie talk on Monday. All right, now we're going to take uh, mailbag questions. What do we have first? TJ writes, what's up, Collider crew? I hope all of you are doing well. <clears throat> with Quentin Tarantino allegedly only making two more films, who would you like to see work with Tarantino that has not already? I read in a 2012 Screen Rant article where Tarantino is quoted saying he would want to work with Johnny Depp, Meryl Streep, and Michael Caine. <clears throat> Sorry. If I could pick one actor, I would choose Bokeem Woodbine after seeing his performance in FX's Fargo Season 2. I would love to hear your choices. Thanks. Um, I mean, since Tarantino's good at resurrecting careers like he did with John Travolta, and then he kind of like takes people who aren't as well known, like Sam Jackson was a character actor yeah. before Pulp Fiction. He blew him up. Christoph Waltz, no one had heard of. He blew up. You know, I think Nicolas Cage, it's time for <laughs> him to, to have a resurgence. That's you know? a good pick. Like, yeah. just like Matthew McConaughey kind of was doing st some movies that people weren't too fond of, but he had the talent. Nicolas Cage has the talent. He could, you know, and then there's some other people who have kind of like Halle Berry and um, Cuba Gooding Jr. that have kind of gone to the wayside that could uh, a resurrection is in order. Roka? Uh, I have a, a number of them, so I'm going to try and say them real fast. Nicolas Cage already had 
But I like the idea of resurrection with Val Kilmer. Okay. I would love to see Kilmer come back, especially now that he's recovering from the cancer stuff and he's touring with his Mark Twain show again. I would love to see him come back and be used effectively. Tom Hardy would be fun to see in a Tarantino film, just to see them clashing about what they can bring out in each other. Uh, Pacino would be a blast <laughs> if he could ever in any way use Pacino correctly. I think Numi Rapace would be awesome in a uh, uh, Tarantino film. Charlie Theron and Zoe Saldana and definitely Lena Headey from Game of Thrones. I would love to see her in Tarantino's. Uh, in the Tarantino film. Very. So I guess natural born killers kind of doesn't count for this, but I want Woody Harrelson. Again? Yeah. yeah. Well, no, well, no he knew he, he wasn't Quentin directed. Tarantino, he only oh, got, right. he only got right. the story like by credit. Moments. So yeah, I, that yeah, doesn't yeah, really qualify point. as having worked together, but just given his range and what he's capable of, I mean, really the possibilities just seem endless if he paired up with Tarantino. And then just to throw an, an up and coming name out there, I'm just really excited about everything Anya Taylor Joy is doing. Mm. I don't know if I'm pronouncing her first name right anymore, even though it's spelled like that. Cause we saw Split the other night and when she was introduced, I think they kept calling her Enya or something. <laughs> Like, that doesn't sound right or look right. But anyway, she's in The Witch. She's in Split. She was just in Morgan. And regardless of how you feel about those movies overall, if you're into them or not, she is damn talented. And I just want to see her doing all sorts of different things because I think she's capable of it. Cool. These don't fall in the category of resur need resurrection, but uh, Daniel Day-Lewis and Christian oh, Bale, yeah. hmm. those are the two actors that I'd love to see paired up with, with Tarantino yeah. before he retires <laughs> 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 all right guys now on to live twitter questions you can tweet us at collider video and we'll have wendy pick out a few of those uh wendy what do you got first first one comes from doug turnovian who writes what cinematic universe should have zombies i say star wars thanks and keep up the good work <laughs> take it back don't say that it's not gonna work <laughs> there's there's a book called death troopers out there that i happen to have listened to recently it's not canon, but it is Star Wars with zombies, <laughs> and it, it just it wouldn't work. The second you introduce a zombie apocalypse, even though maybe it can be contained to a ship or a planet, it really it can't be contained. And then it would cause problems for the rest of canon, so absolutely not. And now that I've gotten that out of my system, give other suggestions, because I didn't think of anything. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, I mean, for me, I, I, I just don't think zombies fit in those type of universes. Mm -hmm. Like maybe the universal monsters universe that they're doing but i, I wouldn't want to see zombies introduced in in the mcu or the dcu or anything like that what about you well zombies have already been introduced kind of playfully in the mcu with some of the some of the some of the comics that are out of the realm of the canon yeah. stuff and the mess around so i wouldn't mind seeing that just to see if they could you know come on a whole planet full of this or whatever you could explore it but yeah, it'd be great to see like like the lower the smaller characters like Swamp Thing or what like deal with this kind of stuff. Like if you're gonna resuscitate, you can play around with those kinds of things and the zombies. Uh, definitely not Star Wars, <laughs> but Alien could work. That could work in some way. You could have zombies in some way. Them going to discover a planet, they they're dealing. They think they're only gonna deal with aliens, and then these zombies come out of nowhere as part of it. Like what we're seeing with Kong Skull Island, we think Kong is the actual big thing, but it's actually these whatever John Shiley, John C. Riley calls them skeleton. Crashers or killers or whatever those things are. Uh, skull, skull crawlers. Skull, skull, skull crawlers. That is, is yeah. that what it was? Whatever those things are. But those those look like they're going to be the main villain that they deal with more than Kong. So it could be possible with zombies. Yeah, I don't know. Just for me, introducing zombies, it's almost like it, it's a whole different world. Yeah. It, like it becomes like Alien versus Predator. You right. know, like you take zombies, put zombies into any. Type well, of that era. makes me think of where American Horror Story is. It's movies, but TV. Yeah. Where where that series tends to go wrong is whenever they have a season that introduces more killers or supernatural factors like a lot of people like asylum it's my least favorite mm. because it introduces like aliens and then it's got the asylum aspect it's got slashers it's it's too much i think we should keep them separate zombies should be their own series single movie whatever it is mm. all right all right what's next this one comes from vince seller no who writes over over or under 50% Vader uses his lightsaber in Rogue One. I say over. I say over. Uh, why, you know, you have him in there, like, at least one scene. Mm. And then maybe not a huge battle, but just, yeah. I say under because they promote this film as no Jedi. And Anakin was a Jedi and became a Sith. So it's still two sides of the same coin. So I'd be surprised if they if they had him pull out his lightsaber. I think he's more powerful using the force, the force. choke, you walking with his presence. And if you have that aspect of it, 
it kind of takes away from what you're trying to create with Krennic, uh, with Ben Mendelsohn's character. And so for me, I think it's better as him as some looming danger rather than an actual participant mm -hmm. in the danger. And if he's in that TIE fighter, in that scene where it rises and Jin is walking towards it on the, on the platform, I would love that. I don't think we're going to get any lightsaber battle. I will say over, though, because I wouldn't be surprised if at some point we just saw him ignite it. And especially because mm. the movie is so heavily focused or referencing the use of a kyber crystal. Yeah. I think it would only enhance that just to see how else they can be used beyond just what they power. All right. All right. What's next? Um, all right. This one comes from Phil Fang Fung, who writes, do you prefer owning movies digitally or physically? Uh, I mean, for convenience sake, I'd like to have everything digitally. It's just in the quality that I want, which is <laughs> which is Blu-ray, that's not possible. I'd, I'd love to have something small like this that holds like all my whole movie collection, just like how it holds my music collection and has that type of quality, but it doesn't at that, you know. And then also I enjoy all the extra features that come with Blu-rays that a lot of the digital stuff does not. So for now, I, I, I still enjoy buying uh, physical media. What about you? We all know how much I stress about yes. my organizing of my DVDs and Blu-rays. So I like to just keep it simple, have them mostly in my iTunes library, and then you can just organize them. So that just as a stress reducer, that's the way I go. But I also just like to cram in as much material as quickly as possible. And for me, the easiest thing is just powering on my laptop or my Apple TV. Everything is right there in the library. This is, this is just me being lazy because now I'm picturing it and it's only because my Blu-ray player has to be uh, hooked up through the HDMI cable and I'm just too lazy to connect it and I don't have a shelf underneath the TV so it won't reach. Okay, um, clearly that is why I don't have very many DVDs or Blu-rays out here. People are very interested in the conversation you, me, and Sinead had uh, about Blu-rays the other week. Mm -hmm. I really oh, yeah. couldn't believe how long. I thought that was the silliest mailbag question when we got it, and it turned into like the biggest discussion. I still discussion. get tweets and pictures. <laughs> yeah. People have sent me pictures of how they've how they organized People like stuff. to send me pictures of theirs organized by franchise just to stress me out. <laughs> it's terrible. <laughs> Roka? Oh, I'm a hunter-gatherer, so to me it's, it's about owning it and having it in my hands mm -hmm. like there's no like recently uh, barnes and noble has the 50 percent off criterion sale i went over there and bought like four of them like it's it's like uh, i need to have and i need to see them and i need they need to be in front of me and it drives certain people i've dated before crazy mm -hmm. because i like to have things in front of me stacked in front of me so i can decide what i want to watch and i don't want it in stacks mm -hmm. behind stacks no it has to be visible for me to watch it i don't like it digitally because like you dennis I, 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 the quality matters to me. I, I'm not an audiophile, so to me, I can listen to something 96 or 128K. It doesn't matter to me. But when I'm watching a movie, it has to be as clean as possible. I have a 3D television for that reason. I'm trying to really resist getting a 4K television for that reason because I just am such a massive fan. That's why I host a podcast called The Cinephiles because I'm a massive fan of films as purely and crisply as they can be seen. So for me, I like to own the Blu-rays. I like to have them in my hand. When the war happens and AI takes over, mm. I will have these... <laughs> to be able to watch to show future generations when we survive okay. the apocalypse. Better so question for you, though. Yes. W w when they were doing the, the dances by the campfire, how did you <laughs> capture those <laughs> and lock them into your collection? Those were put on the wall. <laughs> those survived, didn't they? They weren't digitally put in my head. Okay. or in some plan. Those survived. People still finding those things. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what's next? Kenner's dad writes, what actor would you say is stuck in your mind as one character? Oh, good question. <laughs> Oh, I mean, this kind of goes into the whole. I mean, I think Daniel Bruhl's a good actor, but like now, like he's playing that Nazi twice, so now he's playing, you know. I would I say that he's so good in uh, Rush, though. Yeah, yeah he is. He is. Good. I'm not saying he's not a talented yeah. actor. I'm just saying, like, getting. He's starting to get tight. Hopefully, this is his last Nazi movie. I would say Downey Jr. He does the same shtick in every film he's in, and, and it's not it's not a it's not a criticism because people love it. But he's doing the same sarcastic, snappy banter that he does in every film. I, I recently saw the one I hadn't seen before, the one with uh, Jamie Foxx, where he does plays the violinist. I forget what the name of that one was, uh, and he's doing the same mm. stuff. And and you're like, oh, this was all coming for a long time. It's his style. So whatever you put him in, this is what you're gonna get from Downey Jr. Uh, same thing with Tom Cruise. Tom Cruise is always Tom Cruise in everything he's in. So Tom Cruise is Tom Cruise, right? <laughs> You're not going to get much out of Tom Cruise, except for maybe Magnolia, where he kind of veers away from it. But even then, he's still a cocky guy in that film until he breaks down in front of his dad's bed, which was in Magnolia. Magnolia! <laughs> so, I mean, uh, so to me, it's like this kind of thing is, is uh, I think Downey Jr. is definitely, is, he's, he's Tony Stark all the time. Yeah, I mean, people say 
similar things about Will Ferrell and Vince Vaughn, who sure. we mentioned earlier, playing the same characters. I'll go back to Inglorious Bastard and, and say uh, Christoph Waltz. Okay. Because oh, yeah. really, after that movie, he was kind of typecast as a villain character. Mm -hmm. And even though I think he's a talented actor beyond what he delivered in that movie, I always saw little hints of Hans Landa in every single performance mm -hmm. he gave after. So I think I'd have to go that route. Yeah, even in that commercial campaign that he's on, he has... Little Hans Landa yeah. going, <laughs> even in the weird little American commercial campaigns. All right, uh, last question. All right, last one comes from Evan Ryan, who writes, why do people find it easier to know that Fantastic Beasts is 70 years ahead but struggle to know the Rogue One timeline? Ooh. Uh, do people, wait. is that like a wide, a widely known thing? Can, I, can you say that? What's the, qu what's the question? I got lost halfway through. So through. why do they know that Fantastic Beasts is 70 years ahead of the Potter story, but they don't know that Rogue One is a prequel? Oh. Why not do a prequel, people not but know? why do people not know that? I don't know if it would be fair to generalize that. I think it's just a matter of you know how entrenched you are with the franchise. Mm -hmm. I mean, I really, I given this question, I'd be curious to you know yeah. walk out onto the street and ask how many people the timelines of those two movies, and just to see what the large majority yeah. know. I, I think some of the confusion comes from the placement in terms of you still have the episodes going on with yeah. Star Wars, so we do have Episode Eight coming out next year. Right. So there are maybe some people that are confused. Oh, here's the next story. Is this Episode Eight? No. What is this thing? Where? Fantastic Beasts is coming after the incomplete Harry Potter series is done, right. and then so now it's easier because the next Fantastic Beast or the next Harry Potter universe movie is going to be following this one, and it's going to be Fantastic Beasts. Where Star Wars is going to keep alternating, mm -hmm. it's going to be weird. It's going you have the Han Solo movie that's going to take place at whatever time. Th right. There's going to be various different timelines, so I think that's where the confusion comes. Uh, from. Canon is hard to follow for that reason. I mean, I I read and watch just about everything and you know there's there's often times where i have to go online and look at the star wars timeline just to see where whatever book i'm reading let's say falls yeah i, I think it's a matter of the costumes too like you can tell in the fantastic beast preview it's the 1920s or 30s or 40s whatever they're doing the 1920s i guess is what it said you you get that vibe and with star wars the rebels are rebels so they're constantly like having to pick up whatever they can pick up and look and so it's it's a scru it's a scruffier look so there, it, you can't necessarily figure out where it is in the timeline unless you're a hardcore follower of the canon. So to me, that that affects it as well. You know, what they're wearing in Rogue One is reminiscent of New Hope, but it isn't New Hope's clothes necessarily. Mm. It's a it's a glossier, higher higher uh, uh, stylized version of it. So. Yeah. All right, guys, uh, that's it for this episode. I want to thank the people joining me at the table today. Roka, where can people find you? All right, guys, you can always find me at the Roka Says on Twitter and Instagram. Love communicating with you guys. Follow me there. Uh, watch, listen to The Cinephiles. Uh, we just dropped, uh, what did we drop today? The Muppet Movie. We dropped The Muppet Movie today, which we interviewed a puppeteer who is the production manager over at Jim Henson's uh, Puppet Office, whatever the production company is called. So there it is. And also, of course, uh, Super Animation Game Time every, every Wednesday at 1 p.m. on Geek & Sundry Twitch channel. And... The Walking Dead review show Sunday nights with Perry and I and supposedly guest Dennis Zhang, but really <laughs> series regular at this point, Dennis Zhang, uh, every Sunday night around 7 o'clock Pacific Standard Time. Perry? You guys can find me on Twitter and Instagram, at P. Nemroth, best of the week every Saturday, Collider Nightmares, which is now on Wednesday. Please don't forget and tell everybody. And then in addition to Walking Dead, there's also the Ash vs. Evil Dead recap show after Ash, which I highly recommend you check out as well. Uh, Sinead? I'm online at Sinead DeFries and at that's so Sinead.com here on Mondays hosting TV Talk, on Fridays hosting Movie Talk, and hosting Mailbag over the weekend. And Wendy, where can people find you? You can find me on YouTube at the Movie Couple channel and on Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat at Wendy Lee Zaney. And you guys can find me on Twitter at Think Hero, Instagram, Dennis.TZNG. You'll find me on Movie Talk on Fridays, Mailbags on Saturdays, and popping up on some reviews, like Roka said, on The Walking Dead and a few other things. Yeah. Uh, don't forget to subscribe to this YouTube channel. That's YouTube.com slash Collider Videos, and we'll see you guys next time. Hey, guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.